Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Planning Commission for May 9th, 2011. Uh, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Will the clerk please call roll. Commissioner Ferris. Here. Commissioner Price. Here. Commissioner Reynolds. Here. Commissioner Turpel. Here. Chair Fisher. Here. We will move on to public comments. Uh, members of the public are invited to address the commission on issues that are within the commission's purview and not on the agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Uh, I have one speaker card under public comments, and that's Todd Lundy. Mr. Lundy, please state your name, city of residence, and you have five minutes. I've Thank been you. here before. Uh, Todd Lundy, 58-year uh, resident here in Thousand Oaks. I was born here. Um, the reason for my, my coming to you tonight is to inform you that uh, I believe Mini Mansions has a project on Las Feliz that will uh, come, come before your board. It may come this year, it may come next year. I would uh, highly suggest that you uh, don't vote for this project. Um, the, the short distance between um, Old Canal School Road and Thousand Oaks Boulevard has been overbuilt. And I speak from 38 years in construction. I'm a general contractor. I've been a superintendent, framing foreman. I know what I'm talking about. Um, the state obligates me to um, basically bring any kind of um, situation to their attention. Uh, what I would like you guys to do tonight, please do this. Uh, it would take five minutes out of your time. Go up to, when you leave tonight, go up to Old, uh, Old Canal School Road, turn up to Los Feliz, and come down. Now, you'll notice that there's apartments, and, and you'll, you'll eventually see the lot. But really, take a look at the, the buildings, but look past the buildings at the amount of people that have been placed in this area. And what we have at the end of the street is a very dark corridor that at night, when, when the cars are there, um, the city has cut, sent out people, and they say, oh, there's monolithic sidewalks, which is basically dirt pass. But at night, the cars are there, and we have... Um, you know, that we have a lot of poor in that area that are walking in the streets with baby carriages. There's three wheelchair people that are in the street because there's no real way to get down to Thousand Oaks Boulevard. And what I would like, like this commission to do is really think about approaching the city and complete that piece of sidewalk. Now, the city's eager to get pedestrian traffic on the boulevard, but you've got to give these people a safe way. Personally, I've seen two people almost die there, two small children, 
over the past four years. This is a danger, and I don't want you to wait until someone dies to recognize it. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm upset about this because I've been taking this to the city council for two years. And what we've decided to do is just take it to the state. And I'm going to be walking the neighborhood, and I will get every resident to sign this paper. And I will bring that paper to you to, so you can take a look at it. But in our area, these are the oldest houses in Thousand Oaks. And yes, it's declared a redevelopment area. But when we see um, stimulus money being used for a, a million and a half uh, a dollar bicycle lane over there on Jans, or you know, you can put in uh, angled parking here, but you can't complete the sidewalk to allow the children to get down to uh, Teal Boulevard. And believe me, the children, 7-Eleven is like a magnet to all of these children, and there's a lot of them there. And you've got several of, of uh, your, um, uh, well, for, for the, the outset, for the mini mansions, they own three or four apartment buildings in that area. And most of these people, they have one car. And when their husband leaves, their, their kids are left, or their wives are left pushing the kids in the street. And I'd really like you to just, please, do me a favor. Tonight, just take a drive down there. And then look at the quality of work we get from the city. Out of all my, oh, sorry. Out of all my complaints, um, they finally redid the, the sidewalk in front of the old canal school. But the type of quality that we get, they didn't put a curb to keep the, the dirt from coming down. So there's, there's always mud and dirt on that uh, path. And then if you want to go the other way on Amon, this is a beautiful thing. You have, this is a state and federal violation. You have a handicap ramp put in by the city with a fire hydrant right in the middle of it. There's no way around it. And then further up the street by Quinta Vista, there is a handicap ramp, and about 30 feet up the thing, there's a fire hydrant right in the middle of the, the um, sidewalk, and that was on a state grant. Now, the people over there are getting kind of upset because it's like we're a throwaway city or a throwaway piece of the city. Well, we're not. We're, we've been there the longest. We've paid the taxes the longest, and all we're asking for is safety for our, our people. Thank you for hearing me. Any questions? Any questions of the speaker? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, if I could, one question. Um, you started off your uh, comments there talk, saying that you were opposed to the many mansions uh, project, and then you went into the sidewalk issue. If the sidewalk were to be completed, would you still oppose the many mansions Not project? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. The, the, the reason why I'm saying is this, the city's ignoring the fact that they are literally overbuilding this area. And I know it's for convenience. Uh, they did a traffic study for the mini mansion project they put in there. And uh, it shows, uh, I'm not sure how many trips, but it, I, I did the math on it, and it shows a car going down there every two minutes. So that, this is a dangerous thing, and like I said, uh, the last time I approached the city, I w went, I was on my way home for work, I saw this kid almost get hit, and I drove right over because there was a council meeting that night. And I apologize to them for being so angry, but it just, it just frustrates, frustrates me to no end. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Uh, next speaker, uh, Nick Kidway. Welcome back, Mr. Kidway. Haven't seen you in a while. I begin in the name of God, who is most beneficial, most merciful. Nick Kidway, resident of Newberry Park. Last time I checked, Mr. Ferris, still director of a small group of citizens for concerned citizens of Thousand Oaks. The gentleman that just left called me a, tr a troublemaker is here. Well, the shelf life of an uh, activist in the city is maybe two, three years. Uh, and it starts out because people see one issue that they are familiar with, it affects their home, and they keep coming, and then they see the lost cause. There's very few people like, uh, I can say, junior commissioner now, I guess, that uh, leaves and comes back. And that's one of the reasons I like the term limit, is that uh, People should come back. And one of the things, I mean, I was thinking, I mean, there was an act of God. I mean, if this gentleman wasn't here, I would not be able to speak because time would have gone. And 
people do not take the first step or participate in their government anymore. I mean, it's very sad. And that one of the things that really I have no answer for is that, you know, seven people are sitting there, five are volunteers. But when any of these are removed, for whatever reason, they will not come up and sit over here and participate. And I've seen so many commissioners, I mean, participating for 20 years. Why is that so? I mean, I know a lot of concerned citizens who were not involved because we were going to have a three-peat and the Lakers were going to take over. And now, I mean, who's going to watch? I mean, it's over. We need to folks fight for our rights. We need to fight for our citizen, uh, for our city. It's worth fighting for. Just don't take it for granted because slowly, it, like Commissioner Ferris said, I just remembered the issue of the frog in, a, in, in water. I think he said that uh, many years ago. It just came to my mind. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, no? I think you said it, that if you put a frog in a, in a water and ra slowly raise the temperature, he will not, uh, uh, he will, uh, not feel the heat until uh, he dies, if you do it slowly. I believe somebody in these high days had said that, and it, I cannot remember what I said yesterday, but I can remember some of the times before. One of the things uh, that I feel strongly about and which brought many citizens, like the last gentleman over here too, was the atrocious, ugly, dangerous city hall. Uh, city hall, I was going to say, it's an auto mall sign, which was cost two planning commissioners their jobs. One openly, one was a gentle lady, and she, she never admitted to it. But one of the things that was said from this days here was, this is our sign. No taxpayers are involved. No taxpayer dollars are involved. Now tomorrow, on the agenda, the city is going to buy that strip of land where the, where, next to the freeway. And so in a closed session, I mean, for God's sake, why are these, I mean, is this, I mean, something to do with Obama, Obama Osama bin Laden, I mean, Al-Qaeda? I mean, what is it? Why is it on a closed session? And why is there no discussion at least before uh, the price is discussed? I guess the price can be uh, not in the glare of TV lights. But it's in closed session. And I bet, in fact, I got, I sent an email to a few hundred people, and I got no response. And I got one response and said, could you explain what it is? I mean, they don't even understand. I mean, and that's what it is. I mean, that's what the planning commission thing is all about. Now you're going to train two planning commissioners to learn the ropes because there is a, I mean, it's not English. I mean, there's another language about uh, EIRs and S S SFDs and uh, MNDs and statement of overriding consideration so that uh, people think it's all gobbledygook. And in fact, uh, the title of your cases are such that uh, it doesn't make any sense to the uh, average taxpaying citizen. Why am I upset? Well, a few years ago, uh, the fee for filing something with the Planning Commission was about $300. After that, it was raised to 500 I know it because I paid for it, uh, it for the overexpansion of the Ralph Shopping Center. Now it's $1,200. The last meeting was on the 11th of April. Not a single citizen attended. I mean, there was an applicant. That's the only one. Right now, also, it's an empty chamber. I paid gas for gas at Costco of all places for $4.25. I mean, we are addicted to oil. We are wasting all this energy with, I mean, a planning director said 280 bulbs over here. And we have a perfectly good uh, hall, but you won't even meet there. And you won't change your schedule. The meeting routinely is, is postponed. And you won't go to a quarterly meetings. For God's sake, let's improve this city. Thank you very much for letting me speak, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kidway. Uh, written comments, announcements, continuances. Mr. Town. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just two points. First of all, the, uh, the first public speaker this evening referenced a mini mansions project on Los Feliz. Um, that's actually an area housing authority project that was approved by the uh, Planning Commission and City Council about a year and a half ago for 60 affordable units. And uh, I will forward the speaker's comments on to our public works department. Uh, with regard to the sidewalks. Uh, in addition, uh, we did have a supplemental packet which was issued uh, this afternoon with regard to, to uh, the CDD reports and referral item uh, 7C in your uh, packet this evening, and that included 
that being the supplemental packet included copies of the city's public buildings and recreation elements, which uh, all of the commissioners may not have had, as well as some revisions to CIP consistency items for CIP projects, which I will go over at that time. And that's all I had now. Thank you. Will the clerk please call case 6A. Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6A regarding case SUP 20117051. Applicant, New Singular Wireless PCS LLC, request to allow installation of a wireless communications facility at a hospital building and temporary antennas on an existing parking structure. Location 215 West Jans Road. Mr. Chua. Good evening, Commissioner Fisher, members of the Commission. For your consideration tonight is SUP 2011-70051. The request is to allow a permanent um, wireless facility at the uh, hospital and a temporary, a temporary facility at the hospital, at the um, parking garage of the hospital. The uh, aerial site shows the uh, per location of the permanent site, which is at the uh, existing penthouse of the uh, hospital, and the temporary site at the um, g parking garage. The, um, oh, uh, before I continue on, um, new singular wireless for the commission's information is operating under the brand name of AT&T. So you see the AT&T logos on the uh, submitted uh, exhibits. Um, according to the applicant and as um, confirmed by our, our consultant, the uh, site is required by the, uh, by the applicant to enhance an existing coverage in the area in the immediate vicinity of Lynn Road and, uh, uh, and Jans. The uh, design would, the uh, permanent design would require uh, three sectors of antennas with three antennas each, totaling up nine antennas, a GPS, and equipment cabinets. All the antennas would be located in the existing penthouse of the um, hospital. The, um, the antennas would be located on the north side, west, and east sides of the penthouse. All of them would be behind a R an RF trans um, transparent material, and they will not be visible to the, uh, commun to the community. Um, there will be no exterior changes noticeable to the uh, penthouse. As you can see on the site, eleva on the site elevation, um, it's pointed out the location of one of the sectors of the antenna. It's within the uh, existing, uh, existing penthouse as mentioned. And this too shows the other two sectors of the antenna. Now, um, Something that's a little bit different about this application is that the applicant is requesting a temporary site before a permanent site is built. According to the um, applicant and uh, hospital representative, the doctors, who the medical staff who are members who are um, um, subscri subs subscribers of the um, of AT&T Wireless, loses uh, signals inside the hospital during an important uh, medical procedure. Now the um, temporary site will have three sectors of two antennas each. Each of the antennas are approximately six feet high, 11 inches wide, and about four inches thick. The antennas would be installed on the upper portion of the uh, um, parking structure columns facing east, west, and north. The um, antennas would be within a, an RF enclosure which is about six foot high, two feet wide, and about 18 inches or foot and a half deep. The height of the enclosure um, from, the, uh, from the bottom of the enclosure varies from 17 feet to 20, uh, 20 feet. The, um, there's a um, condition that requires the antennas, the, uh, the RF materials to be uh, enclosed to match uh, the existing columns. Um, textures and, and painted to match the uh, columns, basically. 
it is the staff's opinion that there will be no visual uh, impact from the enclosures because of the fact that one, the um, building, the the the, an, the antennas are installed internally, internalized within the uh, subject property. There are also uh, medical buildings in between the parking areas, so the antennas are virtually out of sight from um, from Lynn Road or Jans Road. Um, staff is recommending time limit for included for the removal. This is because it's a temporary site. It's not a violation of any state law because of the fact that it's um, it's a uh, temporary wireless facility, not a permanent one. We are the staff is recommending that uh, the the um, that a 12-month limit be imposed on the temporary site to ensure that it would be removed in time. However, because of the fact that staff or uh, there's no uncertainty on when the completion of the hospital will be completed, um, the staff is recommending two six-month extensions at the maximum um, and only approvable if the applicant has um, prove, proven that they are actively pursuing to obtain permission for the site. Um, like I've mentioned before, there are no temporary sites that has been approved in the city before because of the fact that this is a hospital and it's important that any of those calls that are being dropped within the hospital are maybe life-saving. Staff is taking a, an exemption to this particular case. Um, at this, at, in your screen would be the um, temporary wireless antennas to be installed along the column. Um, this is the uh, photo simulation. As you can see, it's uh, installed towards the top of the uh, portion of top portion of the column. This is the north elevation, and on the west elevation, taken from the parking area, would be the um, the other two sites, the other two sectors. This project is considered exempt from CEQA, uh, categorical exemption one because it's a, uh, considered a minor alteration to an existing structure. Um, with that, uh, staff is recommending approval based on the findings and conditions detailed in staff report, and I now uh, turn over to Mr. Kramer, the city's wireless consultant. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners, Vice Chair. Uh, the projects before you tonight are, are interlaced uh, in terms of the fact that they are designed to provide immediate long-term coverage as well as explained. And this is a bit unusual. We, we haven't had requests for temporary sites, although uh, there are certainly good reasons why temporary sites may be uh, uh, considered by the Planning Commission. And this certainly would seem to fall into into that, uh, that category of, of appropriate ones for your consideration. My review of the project has been to look at the radio frequency coverage maps to also evaluate the uh, RF safety, compliance with federal rules. Uh, the maps that have been forward or that have been put forward into the record are consistent. Um, there is a low co uh, low signal coverage in the area now. It's not devoid of signal, but it is currently low. And AT and T intends the permanent site to resolve that issue on a long term basis, and to use the temporary site to resolve that on an immediate basis. Uh, the only thing worth noting is uh, that, that hasn't been raised by Will so far is that as for the temporary site, normally the base cabinets require a, a permanent foundation because of their weight. Uh, the applicant is proposing, however, a, a temporary foundation called cell blocks. It's, a, it's actually a, a specific material and interlocking structure that's used to provide a temporary uh, foundation for the cabinets to allow, frankly, for the easy removal later. Uh, so I actually note that as a positive in the project, uh, that once the temporary site is removed, uh, we won't be left with a uh, permanent foundation adjacent to the parking structure. I think that's the only relevant thing I have to add in terms of the project description that may not be obvious. And of course, I'm available for your questions uh, throughout the process. Questions of staff? Uh, I've got, oh, go ahead. Commissioner. 
I just had a, a question, uh, Mr. Kramer. The, uh, and the gosh, just floods back as to when I used to operate the radio stations and talk about RF, and it's still as complicated today as it was then. But I, I noticed in the packet it talked about a, uh, uh, and I don't understand why this is, but there's a, a previous um, installation SUP that's been approved by T-Mobile to go on to the hospital uh, in that same general area. And I know that you did a, uh, a survey taking a look at it to make sure there was no interference. I'm just curious, uh, is that non-installed site taken into account when you, when you take a look at that? I definitely did take a look into that, into that uh, prior case and looked at my notes. And I also looked at the antenna orientations. Uh, there's simply no cumulative effect between the two sites. So um, had there been an issue, I would have raised that in my uh, evaluation. In any event, um, even if there had been a cumulative effect, because the antennas are pointing out essentially the, the only controlled zone from this, from this project or from T-Mobile's project would be in open, inaccessible airspace, there, it, it, there isn't a restriction. When we look at RF safety, we typically look at where, where the public can actually wander into it. This is simply not the case in this project. So that if T-Mobile did go for forward with their installation, there, we wouldn't have an issue there at all? No issue uh, as to them independently or cumulatively. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I've got a couple. I don't know if it, I haven't decided if it's a question or a, uh, a comment. Um, with the temporary facility, um, I'm certainly concerned with the two six months extensions, uh, seeing other projects in the city from uh, various cell phone companies. Uh, it tends to drag on. Um, so I guess that's my first comment. Second comment is, is uh, you know, I don't know that I'm totally convinced that you know, a temporary site you know, uh, is supported by uh, physicians wanting their cell phones. You know, certainly, I don't want my doctor working on me and answering the cell phone at the same time. So um, that's my comments. And if I'm missing something, uh, please let me know. Um, the um, we we um, if you if you look at temporary um, uh, condition number six for temporary antenna removal. Um, our basic concern when we were uh, told about the temporary site is the removal. The temporary becoming a permanent site is one of our biggest concern. Now, uh, as far as the removal is concerned, um, typically a uh, temporary site is granted for about 18 months. And in this case, we shortened it to 12 months because of the fact that we really don't, we really want we, we don't want to lose sight of the temporary site. After 12 months, if they did not, uh, if the applicant uh, does not ap approach us for an extension, then they will be in violation of these conditions. Now, if they approach us to request for another six months, they will have to provide us an ex um, a very good reason why we should um, approve an extension for that, uh, for that temporary facility. As far as uh, support from the physician, in my discussion last week, in the discussion last week with the staff, we were informed that there were at least, what, 32, 36 physicians who are actually signed a petition to uh, hold this. Um, Mr. Town can correct me if I'm not, if I'm not accurate on that number. So um, we were told that there is uh, support from staff on this issue. I mean, from a from the medical personnel who are subscribers of uh, the applicant. Yeah, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's support for better coverage uh, inside the hospital. Uh, instead of I guess doing the stance of extensions, why, you know, could we say you've got six months to complete your project and call it good? Um, there is uncertainty about the. Um, schedule on the on these uh, particular projects um, maybe the representative mr. Jerry Ambrose could answer that question as far as um, when they expect to complete the site um, they're taking into account uh, obtaining permission from Ashpod the state so um, that is something that 
uh, staff is not familiar with, so that may be a question for uh, Mr. Ambrose. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner? Yes, I had a question. Um, actually, and it may be a comment as well, rather than a question. But um, in my reading here on uh, page, it's page five of the SUP, but in the temporary facility design, it, uh, and I quote, in addition to the permanent site, the applicant is proposing to install temporary antennas to provide coverage at the hospital while the permanent site is approved by the state and subsequently constructed. So that would lead me to believe that they don't uh, require the same approval process from the state for this temporary site. Is that correct? I don't know who I, I'm asking the question of, but <laughs> somebody uh, over there. <laughs> I think both of us are unclear as to what the state process is because we deal with the local process, so we're, perhaps the applicant can explain that. Well, okay. Um, perhaps. I, I just note that this is a staff report, so I was assuming that We'd have that answer, but okay. I'll wait. Mr. Town. Perhaps I can augment those comments. Um, it is staff's understanding that the applicant is, is obligated to obtain OSHPOD approval because the permanent antennas are proposed inside the penthouse, so they're inside the structure. That's normal for any hospital in California that they have to require, have to obtain state approval for the antennas. For antennas that are outside, such as the temporary facility tonight or any of the other facilities in the city, those are only under local control and the state does not get involved. So that is part of understanding. Um, it is also staff's uh, understanding that it would take approximately six to eight months to construct the permanent facility once they have, the applicant obtains approval. Uh, construction is not dependent on the addition of the fourth floor to this newest wing, which is currently three stories, and you may have read in the papers recently where that work was just inaugurated. Um, and just also to follow up on one of Mr. Chu's previous comments, uh, I did speak with a hospital representative uh, last week and, and uh, they did indicate that doctors had signed a petition asking for this coverage, uh, including doctors that work in the emergency room nearby. Um, we do have a representative of uh, the hospital uh, here tonight that is available for questions. So that, that may, may, he may be able to, offer additional information. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go to the uh, applicant, uh, Jerry Ambrose. Mr. Ambrose, please state your name, city of residence, and you have 15 minutes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Jerry Ambrose. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. My address is 3905 State Street, Santa Barbara, California. Uh, I'd like to answer your questions. Uh, I guess I'll start with, uh, I guess the easiest question is um, the difference in permitting between the temporary site and the permanent site. And uh, as was stated, the, um, the installation on the parking garage does not require OSHPOD approval because it is not on the hospital building itself. So we would be coming through the city uh, for, our, uh, for our building permit uh, on that. Uh, in, in, uh, in terms of your question regarding the, the, the 12 months and the extensions, there's a little bit of uncertainty on the OSHPOD process uh, on our part. Uh, the hospital, as you know, obviously is going through a large renovation, and we think we can go through that process separately, but if we somehow get wrapped up in that OSHPOD process for their, their work, that may cause us uh, some unforeseen delays. So. Um, we would ask that you that you approve the the recommended time periods as as suggested by staff. And in regard to the the use of the the, the service, uh, it's my understanding, and I believe the hospital representative can probably um, provide more detail that the service uh, the AT and T service has a certain application that can actually be used in certain medical procedures, and that only comes from the AT and C service. And that can be somehow plugged in, I guess, into the, the medical equipment. I'm not a technically technical person, but that's that's my understanding uh, as well. And that's also why the service is critical uh, for that particular area. Um, and I think that answers your questions. And I'm here to answer any, any additional questions. Uh, overall, we just ask that you approve the project uh, as recommended. And um, I'm open for questions. Questions? Commissioner Price? Okay, you're up. 
Uh, just uh, there were a couple of things that I was reading the staff report. By the way, you know, this could have been easy as far as the hospital was concerned because you could always told them to sign up to Verizon and then you guys would have been out of this altogether. <laughs> but the, um, I'm curious, I was reading there's some sites that are in the city where they've gotten permits and they've never been constructed and your company has one of them over, I believe, in the transportation center. Why would that be? Why would you choose not to put a site the up? The, I'm sorry, the transport, you mean the, uh, the Caneo grade? Is that what I'm talking about? Yeah, that, that, one, that one's underway. Some of the utility work is underway. As, as you may know, we have to go through an encroachment permit process with Caltrans, mm -hmm. and that was just recently approved. So we are doing some of the utility work uh, currently, so that is actually underway. Oh, so it is moving forward. Okay. It is underway. You just can't see anything above, above ground. At the okay. I was just curious when I ran through that as to why you'd go through the process and then not build something out. And we have a couple of other cell companies um, in the city that have done the same thing. So just a point of interest. Thanks. I'm not aware of why T-Mobile hasn't uh, started their project there as well. I, I don't know. Okay. Other questions? Commissioner Ferris. I just wanted to ask uh, for this on the record. It's mentioned in the staff report that uh, by signing the conditions here, you waive your state um, right to, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, it's condition four on here by signing acceptance of these conditions as required by condition 21. The applicant waives all claims that the grant of approval of the temporary site for a period of less than 10 years is unreasonable. Are you okay with yes, that's signing okay. that? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure about sure. that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to uh, public speakers. Uh, have one card, uh, Nick Kidway, Mr. Kidway. B. Okay. Makes it easy. All right. No, uh, no public speakers. Uh, we do have Patrick Smith uh, from the hospital. Any questions, hospital representative? No? And Joel Kirschenstein, uh, representing applicant. Yeah, I... No. Uh, misreading my writing. Okay. Eyes are going. Okay, we're um, back to uh, staff for any follow-up. No further comment from staff. Uh, Commissioner Ferris. Um, I did want to just probe a little bit about the timeline of this, uh, the temporary site and the, and the permanent site. It looks like under the conditions of approval, the permanent site has a three-year uh, tenure of, of how long the permit is good for, but it's unclear to me sort of when the um, temporary site and when the 12 months start ticking? Can they go two years into this before the temporary site gets on? Are they obligated to start that at any point? I'm, I just want to know what the timeline is. Well, okay, as far as uh, the condition is concerned, uh, condition number six indicates that the temporary antenna shall be removed within a 12-month period or within uh, 30 days of the activation of the permanent site. So it's implored, Im implied that the, uh, the antennas would be uh, installed immediately after approval of this uh, special use permit. That's actually not the way I read it, though. It read, it, I read it as if they'll be removed within a 12-month period. It doesn't state when the 12 month period starts though. Then if that's the case, we can uh, tell, we can um, um, amend the condition saying that the, um, the antenna shall be installed or removed within 12 month period. I mean, we, we cannot tell them when to install it. All right, well, one, one, the reason why I ask is, is that if, assume they start immediately and they do for 12 months and then they ask for two six month extensions Nothing in the application allows them to go for the next year if they don't get this permanent site installed. So they'll be taking down a temporary site. Now, I don't think that's what they're, they're interested in. We've had some comments today. We'd like to push this along to get it to, to get going. And so I would just rather, it, the, the timelines are a little inconsistent to me, a little bit, little bit too wishy-washy. I'm just trying to figure out how we can go ahead and 
try to address some of these concerns and not have a, a potential gap in in how these how these things uh, do you understand what I'm, I'm trying to get at there yes um, you basically your concern is when the um, the antennas will be, the temporary site will be installed um, if if the commissioner uh, wish so I mean or you know desire we could instruct them to that the approval that the uh, the temporary site must be installed immediately and removed within 12 months of installation. Or you can you can add a condition saying that it should be installed within 30 days of this approval, if that's where you're uh, getting into. Something like that, I think, would be more more clear as to to moving this along, if that's consistent with what the other commissioners are indicating. But uh, so I'd, I'd actually like to probably hear from staff or other commissioners on that. Uh, Commissioner Tapel, um, the uh, I hear exactly what you're saying, but my thought process is is because of Oshpod, it, it kind of throws the the um, well. Let me rephrase this. I think the 12 month time period starts counting once they get the approval from the state. That was my understanding when I read that, and we don't know when that date's going to be. So how would you formulate that? Because these guys in Sacramento can take forever to do stuff, and that's why the two six months extension were given if they couldn't get the approval. From the state, am I mis am I incorrect in understanding that? Perhaps I can comment on this. Okay. Uh, the intent of Condition Six was really related to the removal of the facility once it's once the temporary facility is constructed, and then the permanent facility is, is constructed to get that temporary facility basically off the parking structure. And I think uh, what the commission is discussing now is is perhaps a, either a change to that condition or an additional condition which would require the applicant to essentially construct the, the facility within a certain time frame, i.e. within 12 months. We didn't include that condition up front because, as was just mentioned, staff was unclear as to how long it may take Oshpod to approve the project. So that's why we didn't include a, a condition to that effect. If the, condition, if the commission does want to impose that condition, it's certainly within its purview, I would just suggest that you may want to uh, go back to the applicant to discuss that point a little bit further in, in terms of the exact time frame within which they anticipate obtaining Oshpot approval and actually initiating construction and finishing construction of the permanent facility. Other questions? Um, God, I don't want to belabor this, but, you know, uh, Commissioner Ferris brought up a good point because now I'm really kind of confused as when that 12, mar 12 month clock starts ticking. That's the only thing. If I may add um, something to this, the um, our goal is not to have the uh, permanent, I mean the temporary facility there forever. So, if once they install once they install the temporary facility, whether that be 30 days from now or a year from now, the, uh, the temporary facility will be removed within 12 months of installation or 30 days after the uh, permanent site has been made active. So if the installation, let's say, for example, does not occur within six months later, then we don't have to see we, there's no temporary site and you know there's nothing out there to be worried about. But if it's been installed, then our condition requires that it be removed within 12 months. So we are not just imposing to put them uh, right after approval. We're, you know, um, if they don't put it right after approval, that's fine because of the fact that there's no temporary site. Now, after the temporary site has been installed, then they have 12 months to either remove it or apply for extension. That was the original frame of thought. So. Commissioner Ferris, I, I I think I understand. I think the the premise of it, the, the what I'm trying to trying to get and understand. At least it seems to me, if for if there was no temporary facility, uh, facility, there is an inherent incentive for them to get their Oshpot approval whenever it is and get it constructed because they want the service. But if there's a temporary uh, approval, they can go through get their Oshpot and they could delay the process of getting the, the the permanent facility. And I think that's what we're trying to prevent. So we would like to figure out how to appropriately provide the temporary service, yet you know, not give them an incentive to delay a permanent facility construction. Does that, does that make sense? 
Uh, that I don't makes know, sense. I don't know how to do that right now, and I think that's <laughs> that's some of the things we're we're trying to wrestle with. But and and this is the reason why um, we only are giving them 12 months. And after 12 months, they are required to prov to uh, apply for a minor modification to approve a six month extension. We didn't give them an outright 18 month approval or 24 month approval. That's why we have the 12 month requirement so that they can turn back and if staff or the uh, director um, feels that they're not doing their part, then we can always deny it after 12 months and they have to remove it. So that's the way we uh, will we'll keep track of it. Any other questions of staff? I think we could probably go to the applicant for rebuttal and... I think maybe some of the questions okay. might be answered. Okay. No other questions of staff? Okay, we'll go back to the uh, applicant, Mr. Ambrose. You have uh, five minutes. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, the temporary facility, when, when the clock should start, uh, please remember that we do have to go through a plan check process with the city. Um, as of right now, the drawings are, are uh, conceptual, I guess, from a zoning, like a zoning drawing level. If, if this is approved tonight, uh, we go back and we start our detailed construction drawings. So we probably have a 30-day process to finish the drawings and then submit into the city's plan check process for a building permit, and that could be 60 to 90 days. So at a minimum, we're 120, probably to 150 days out from pulling a permit to actually start construction of the temporary facility. Now, once we get the permit, and it may take 60 days to actually install the temporary facility, so from, from tonight forward, we could be looking at seven to eight months before we even get it, get it up, just realistically speaking from a permitting standpoint. So what, what, what you could do, I guess, is you could say from, from tonight, you have 12 months, 18 months to, to pull your permit uh, for the temporary facility, and then have the, the timeline start from there, from the point where we actually pull the building permit to start construction as a, as a way to, to set a DMARC. So 12 months to, maybe 12 months to pull the, the permit for the temporary facility. Once the permit is pulled, we, we can have it installed for 12 months, or we can go back to condition number six, and then we concurrently will be processing through OSHPOD. Does that, does that help? <laughs> or did I? Questions? Commissioner Price? I, I get, would you be comfortable with language that's um, said that the 12 months would uh, begin to toll upon issuance of the building permit? Uh, correct. Right. That, that's what I was suggesting. Is that what Something you're suggesting? Something where it's a defined DMARC uh, place. Point. Not that you have 12 months from today, or if it were to be approved, to get the permit, because you could have that in, I think you said, 60 to 90 days. No, no, what I was saying is that, uh, yeah, probably closer to 120. We have another 30 days to finish our drawings, then get into plan check. Um, that kind of, so, yeah, I mean, 90 days would be the absolute best, but it's more likely like 120. 100. Okay, but if we tied the 12-month period to the date that the building permit was issued, um, most of your work is already, well, not most of your work is behind you, but at least the um, development and the plans. The plans are finished. We have a permit. Correct. We can, with the contractor, and get the contractor started. Correct. Okay. That's a logical place to, to start. Thank you. Other questions? No? Any other uh, comments? From the applicant? Uh, no, I'm, I think if I answered your questions, any, I'm, yeah. any other questions you have, I can help. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll close the uh, public hearing and open for a commission discussion or a motion. Commissioner Trapel. Uh, I'm ready. I don't, I don't know how to do this. And so, so I'm actually uh, willing to move forward with a motion on this to approve. Uh, but how do we, since the applicant has agreed to use the DMARC as he used it, how do you make that happen? You make that part of the motion? If I may. Yes. Mr. Norm. Yeah, you would um, amend whatever condition you would like to amend and either delete or insert whatever language you'd like into it. Okay, so you're gonna help me with the language on that? I'll do my best. Okay, great. So what I'd like to go ahead is a, a move, um, move for approval with uh, SUP 2011-70051, 
with uh, staff's recommendations with an amendment to item six uh, dealing with the temporary antenna removal. Um, and uh, Attorney Norman, you're going to have to help me here with the uh, DMARC as the applicant described to uh, for that 12 month time clock beginning at the time that his permit is issued. Just, does, it, does that make sense? See, yeah, let me see if I've got it. So condition six would be the temporary antenna shall be removed within a 12 month period beginning from the time that the building permit is issued. Do I have that? That's correct? what I, yeah. That's and that would I, be inserted after the 12 month period, that language. And then the rest of the condition remain the same? Yes. Does everyone have that? Yep. Mr. Kramer? Or uh, and just to perhaps clarify uh, what the city attorney has just said, uh, the building permit we're speaking of is the building permit for the temporary site so that we don't confuse that with the permanent site. Comments to the motion? Commissioner Reynolds. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make a comment that um, I'm going to, of course, uh, vote in favor of this. Uh, but I, I would hope that after this is finished, I'd like to ask Mr. Kramer a question that's unrelated to this particular item, just about another cell site that I've seen in town, if that's appropriate. Well, I guess you'll catch him in the parking lot oh, after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> no, no other comments? Okay. Uh, I, can I have, just say something to that? Uh, just, Mr. Norman. Yeah. I just would like to remind the commission that if it's not on the agenda, we really shouldn't be discussing it. Unless it's a response to a public comment, you're allowed to kind of address that issue. But if it's something related to the Planning Commission's jurisdiction and it's not on the agenda, it's really not appropriate unless it's on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, I'll make a comment to the motion. I will support it. I appreciate the discussion from the commission. Uh, when we do that, we always come out with a, a pretty good project. And uh, I like the applicant's responses to the questions. Um, I feel much better that uh, uh, medical equipment is attached to this and uh, not someone's ear while a procedure is going on. So I will support the motion. Um, any final comments, Commissioner Trapel? Uh Only that I never knew hospitals had a penthouse. So, <laughs> but other than that, it's it. Uh, vote, please. Motion passed, five zero. And there's a 10-day appeal period. Uh, will the clerk please call case 6B? Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6B regarding case vesting tentative track map 2011-70018, RPD 2011-70019. Applicant, Conejo Valley Unified School District, request to allow the subdivision of three parcels into 10 lots of record. <coughs> Excuse me for the construction of 10 single family dwellings. Location, southwest corner of Avenida de los Arbolos and Atlas Avenue. Mr. Chua. Um, for your consideration tonight is um, Vesting Tentative Track Map 2011-70018 and RPD 2011-70019. The uh, request is to allow the subdivision of three records, three parcels into 10 lots. The uh, three parcels totaling 2.75 acres. Um, and the uh, RPD request is to allow the approval of a 10 single family home development. Um, the uh, property is located on the southwest corner of Avenida de los Arboles. Now, there is a mention of three lot subdivision on this property. Um, not shown on the, uh, on the aerial is the location of the three lots. Actually, there are two small lots um, adjacent to Atlas Avenue. So um, 
I'm sorry. So the property line goes around this one and right around here. So here and here. And I apologize for not showing that. Um, let's see. The, um, as a matter of background, the, uh, this property was zoned back in 91 from PL to an R1, uh, from PL and R110 to an RPD 4.1 4.5U SFD. Um, there was a 10 lot subdivision that was approved back in 92 for um, and also for the construction of 10 single family dwellings. This application right here is basically the same application that was approved and fi uh, filed and approved back then, which has expired. Um, all of the lots is basically rectangular in nature, rectangular in shape, uh, similar to what's uh, similar to the uh, lots that's out there right now. Um, the uh, lot density for the request is consistent with the land use element of the general plan. Each lot will be taken access from uh, Avenida de los Arboles, same as um, most houses along Avenida de los Arboles. Calam will be providing water service to lots one through eight, and CD will provide water services to lots nine and ten of the property. The lots nine and ten would be the uh, eastmost uh, property, uh, eastmost lot uh, adjacent to um, closest to um, Atlas Avenue. Wastewater services will be provided by the city. Uh, the uh, proposed Track map is a vesting tentative track map, um, wherein on a on a vesting tentative track map, all the underlying, all the existing zoning policies, uh, municipal code, at the time of approval would be um, grandfathered in to the vesting tentative track map. The uh, lot sizes for the uh, proposed subdivision would vary from 8,700 square feet to about 14,800 square feet, which is pretty much the same as uh, the um, sizes of the lots in the neighborhood. There are conditions, suggested conditions, uh, to uh, ensure that the, um, the lot is in compliance with the under underlying RPD zone. There are... Um, there are no significant environment environment impacts for the proper, for the uh, subject for the project, and there are no existing there are no conflict with existing easement. Um, the property, the single family homes, to the west of the pro, 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 for the west of the sites, have lot sizes of about eight uh, seventy four hundred square feet. These two lots here are identical, they have about 7,400 square feet. The uh, next property here adjacent to Avenida de los Arboles has 8,700 square feet, which is the smallest lot for the proposed subdivision. Across the way on um, Avenida, I'm sorry, um, Atlas Avenue, the uh, property um, next to the street over would be, uh, is 13,000 square feet and the one adjacent right on the corner of Atlas and Arboles is about 10,890 square feet. So as you can see, the lot sizes are similar to what's existing uh, right now. This would be, since this is a small development, staff is um, requiring that a, condi a condition that um, this be a single phase development. There will be an import of 2,000 cubic yards of fill required for grading. The um, southern wall along uh, f lots five, six, and seven, the southern wall would be the one adjacent to the uh, school property, would have a wall that um, exceed six feet in height because there's an existing retaining wall and there's a great difference between the school and the uh, finished grade, final finished grade of the uh, property. There's an adjacent, there's an existing power pole on lot eight that will be uh, removed and uh, the utilities will be undergrounded. The uh, final home design would require 
a, an approval of a minor modification application at the staff level. At this time, the, the uh, applicant have not presented a final design for the homes. This project qualifies for a um, article, um, class 32 categorical exemption under CEQA for the following reason. The uh, development um, is within city limits and is not more than five acres. There are no endangered species or it's, the site is not providing a habitat for endangered species. The uh, site will be served by uh, existing uti uh, by, uh, utilities and public services. And uh, with that, staff is recommending approval of uh, VTTM 2011-70018 and RPD 2011-70019 based on the findings and conditions detailed in the staff report. Um, staff's ready to answer any question that you may have. Questions to staff. Commissioner Ferris. Thank you. Uh, I apologize in advance for not getting this uh, to you. I noted in the, uh, I guess, page seven of this particular uh, thing, this is where the, where the conditions start. Uh, there's actually two number threes, mm -hmm. and it appears that the one, the, the, the first one has a condition nine, which I think is um, really referring to what is currently, currently number eight, but I think number nine is probably the right number, I'm assuming. Uh, let me catch up a little bit. Okay, I appreciate it. Yes, uh, that that's a typo, and the um, that's the uh, succeeding conditions should be numbered. The second number three, which is other permits, should be numbered four, and the rest should be uh, adjusted accordingly. Yeah. Okay. And, you uh, mentioned that there's a, a reference to condition nine. In, in in number three, there's a reference to condition number nine, which I believe, when they are renumbered, would be appropriately numbered to number, number ten. Nine. So, um, uh, the next one would be condition thirty nine. I I'm, I think I'm reading this right, but I just wanted to double check. It's about s street trees. It says periodically street trees planted by the applicant are being removed by the new homeowner. I'm, I'm assuming that's a standard condition that we're not saying that the applicant is in fact um, planting trees and that there is a homeowner now that's doing it. It's just that in the future, sometimes that happens. Uh, is, is that what what the, uh, the interpretation of that is? We have... Um we have a um, representative from the uh, Public Works Department that may be able to clarify that condition. Um, Wes or? Good evening, Chair Fisher and commissioners. Uh, my name is Wes Tackett. I'm with the Public Works uh, Land Development uh, division. <clears throat> the condition is a standard condition that we put on developments and we've been doing that lately or more recently because um, the developer will will install the street tree, the units get, the homes get sold, um, new homeowner comes in, the project is still under construction technically, it hasn't been finalized, that new homeowner uh, removes the tree. So then the city has to come back and we have to require the developer to plant yet again another tree. So that's how we have that condition. Okay, I, I appreciate that explanation, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Reynolds. Well, Wes is, Wes is sitting up there on lot one, there is a drain or something as I drove by and I noticed that something is going to be removed on the plot plan. What is that, is that a, it's at the far end in front. As you drive by, you'll see. It, it is an, in, uh, an inlet. And so is that going to remain on the property or? I just thought I wouldn't want that in my front yard, and that's why well, I no, it. Well, it. It, it no, uh, it will be removed and improved. That will, not, that will not remain on the and property. And filled in and everything uh -huh. or covered or whatever. Correct. But it, will the drain still be there on the property or will it go? Just so that a homeowner is aware that there's a drain there. No, the drain is being removed. 
Correct. Okay, so there won't be a drain at all on the property then? Correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions of staff? No other questions? Go to the uh, applicant, uh, Joel Kirschenstein. Mr. Kirschenstein, uh, please state your name, city of residence, and you have 15 minutes. Good evening, Joel Kirschenstein, 2801 Townscape, uh, Thousand Oaks. Um, here, I'm uh, here on behalf of the Caneo Unified School District and just wanted to say that this is, uh, we, uh, on the outset, we really appreciate the work that the, that the planning staff has done regarding this process, and I really mean that. Just because we had a previously approved map, everything had to be brought current, and uh, the level of cooperation with us, uh, on, with the district, was uh, exemplary. And, and we really appreciate it. We don't have any um, issues. We uh, approve uh, all the conditions, or recommend approval of all the conditions. I just wanted for clarification to say that this um, process is part of the Caneo Unified School District's asset management program, where they're identifying properties that can be surplused, and uh, this will go out to bid and we will include this entire staff report in the bid package and hopefully uh, we'll get successful bidders, raise some uh, funding for the educational programs in the district. They've already uh, uh, disposed of two properties to date. One was a tripartite arrangement with the city, Park District, and I believe Chappelle. Another one was a disposition, and now this will be the third and uh, probably a few more down, down the sight line. So we really appreciate the cooperation and it eventually winds up in the educational programs of the school district. And um, Rick is here, uh, Rick Jones from the Holland Group, if there's any other additional technical questions. So again, we really appreciate all the work that they did. Thank you. Questions of the applicant? No, thank you, sir. We will go to uh, public comment. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Kidway. Mr. Kidway, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, good evening, Chair Barry Fisher, uh, Nick Kidway, re resident of Newberry Park since 1979 and director of Concerned Citizens of Thousand Oaks. Don't really think uh, I need five minutes uh, that I'm glad that I have the opportunity to speak on this. Some of the issues that I'm concerned about, as are many uh, concerned citizens in the city, I mean, I've been reading, I mean, this is my favorite reading, and I haven't read it for a long time. This is the original general plan, which is the Bible, uh, and it makes you cry to see what has happened uh, in so many ways, just like, you know, my other revered document, which is so small the U.S. Constitution with the Bill of Rights, uh, blown to smithereens by so many agencies, unfortunately. I'm talking about the original PL, which is public land, in 1991 to approve co PD units. I mean, the thing that I and a lot of citizens cannot really understand is why there are so many loopholes and breaks given to other government agencies. Uh, I, for one, am a fan of the Kanea Valley Unified District, of course. I mean, they've been great for my three children. Now my even granddaughter will be uh, in it. Uh, and uh, we wish them the best. Of, and I realize that they have dwindling resources. But that does not mean that uh, they do not follow the rules and procedures. And this issue or the map, well, this project was never done. And it's been 20 years, and to revive it as if it was an active on the project and not really have an outreach program for the residents. Uh, if there was, there would be many more residents here. And uh, those are the issues that so many citizens in this city are upset about. Uh, it was mentioned uh, by the applicant that they're trying to do the utmost about the asset management program. 
asset management or asset mismanagement. Certainly not very efficient, not really goal oriented for parents or, uh, or the students uh, with what has happened with the closure of the schools. And the thing that really sticks out and since you folks are in planning are the, the two issues in my neck of the woods. One is the Kelly property that uh, has been lingering for so many years. I don't know when it's been going to be developed. But that does not mean that the maintenance and operations yard should be left in a state that if I as a businessman had it, it would be shut down in 48 hours. I mean, it's so ugly. I mean, why is it that, I mean, even basic things of screening are not done? And I would appreciate if someone from the Planning Commission would ask that there was a hullabaloo about the Coles, pro Coles project, which turned out to be wonderful. Uh, Kelly home owners, I mean, they have given up. They came and, and fought. Uh, but uh, I've taken pictures, but I sh didn't have the time, and it's not appropriate maybe to bring that uh, and show that at this time. And then, I mean, they don't obey the rules. I mean, they think they're above the rule. And, and there's and so many people in the city that are upset about those ugly, garish signs, I mean, that these people have put up. And so we want uh, uh, consideration for the residents in the neighborhood. I don't think and know if the 4RPD is, uh, is appropriate for the neighborhood. And there should be more of a discussion on that, as well as the proximity next to the school. Uh, I know when my kids have gone to, like, say, Sequoia and all that, there's no parking on the streets and people are upset because it's close to the, to the school. So when these homes, and, uh, which are small, are going to be built, would the owners or prospective owners be notified uh, of the issues of the games that are played over there on the weekends and the parents' night out, etc.? I mean, these should be handled up front rather than uh, in the back. These lights are, I mean, we need another $3,000 timer, I guess. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you, Mr. Kidway. Uh, next speaker, Mr. Bill Wilson. Mr. Wilson, please state your name, city of residence, and you have five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bill Wilson, city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, I've been a resident here in the community for 39 years. Um, I am a resident uh, near this project. I do have a few questions uh, that I would like to try to get answers to. Uh, number one, was the original approval for four lots? Go ahead and okay. go through your presentation okay. and we'll go back to staff. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, uh, the other question and concern I have is uh, concerning the lot sizes. I know that uh, they talked about 8,000 to 11 or 14,000 foot lots. Um, I thought I saw somewhere in the conditions that the minimum lot uh, frontage on our arbalas could be up to 40 feet wide, if I uh, read that correctly. And uh, I, I would have a major concern with a 40 foot minimum lot uh, on arbalas. Um, I built three homes not far from this project. I was conditioned to build single family houses uh, and be in compliance with uh, ridge heights and other various conditions. Uh, I know that in the preci precise plan of design, um, you can allow 60% uh, of the lots to be built as two story homes. Uh, I strongly would be opposed to that because uh, that truly does not comply with the number of properties that are along Arbalas as well as the Summerfield track, which is on Venus and Atlas, which are all single story homes. So there are some concerns relative to the lot sizes and the comply, uh, compliability of the, uh, the existing homes in the neighborhood. Um, I'm not adverse to the development by any stretch of the imagination. I just think that if there were four lots approved, uh, the project's trying to be doubled if that's the case. I think uh, there needs to be some consideration as to uh, whether there should be any two-story properties uh, allowed on that uh, particular piece of property. Uh, questions of the speaker? 
Okay, when we go back to uh, staff, they will uh, answer the questions you brought up, Mr. Wilson. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any other public speaker cards. Uh, we'll go back to uh, staff. Yes, uh, Chair Reynolds, uh, Chair Fisher. Um, regarding the um, comment of the first speaker as far as outreach program, um, I don't know if this is something that I should address, but the uh, on every application that the city receives, we have a notification process. So um, just to let you know that the proper notifications were sent out, the signs were installed as uh, required by the municipal code. As far as weekend activities, given in consideration on construction of the house, I mean, everybody knows that if you buy a house from a school, there will be activities out there. So the school is already there. Anybody buying the property can see the school and would know, uh, would and can associate what's going on as far as school activities are concerned. Now, um, as far as Mr. Wilson's question about the te four lot subdivision, the original approval for this property was for 10 lots. And um, let's see, the other question was the, uh, the width of each lot, the, um, as if you look at the, uh, the exhibit, the, uh, the, no, the lots are either 65 feet wide or 70 feet wide. I mean, lot, meaning lot, uh, uh, what's that, 95 feet? Okay, so lot one, it varies from 65 feet to 95 feet. Most of the lots are 65 feet, the ones in the middle. Uh, lot number one will be 95 feet. Um, and lots nine, nine and ten exceed uh, either 70 or 73 feet. So as far as lot widths are concerned, uh, it's not 40 feet, it's 65 feet minimum. Uh, they all comply with the underlying RPD zone. And that's, uh, that's all I have for now. Questions to staff, Commissioner Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Chua, did you receive any correspondence from any neighbors? I have not received any opposition from the neighbors. As a matter of fact, uh, when the application was first notified, I received two calls from, um, from people who claim they live in the area saying that it's about time that they do something about the property. Although that wasn't reflected in the record because none of, the, um, none of those uh, callers uh, submitted a uh, letter to the city. Thank you. Commissioner Ferris. Um, let me ask a question regarding the condition 10 of the uh, vesting track map. Uh, this is the minimum frontage condition. It t speaks to 40 feet. If, if in fact the exhibits show that it's 65 feet for all the lots, uh, where does the 40 foot come from? Uh, that's a minimum uh, requirement by the municipal code. Okay, it's, so that's a municipal code requirement. Yes. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions to staff? Commissioner Price. Well, I thank you. I had highlighted uh, some language in condition. I guess it's now condition eight. Uh, it, it's Mark seven, but it would be eight, and and it had to do with the uh, minor changes that um, would maybe approved by the uh, community development department, but any substantial changes would require. Um, the filing of a major modification application. I'm just curious what uh, what would constitute a major modification or a substantial change, excuse me. Uh, substantial changes would be anything that they deviate from um, the municipal code. And one, well, let, let me back up a little bit. If let's say, for example, they want to go from 10 lots to 12 lots or to maybe or more, which is quote unquote possible because of the minimum requirement by the municipal code is 40 feet, then they have to go through the planning commission to, um, to uh, get an approval for that type of development. Now, if they are just requiring a minimum uh, changes to lot sizes, meaning lot line adjustment based on um, actual uh, site survey, then that may be approved at the staff level so they don't have to go to the planning commission. Because, because of the fact that you know some, some minor changes may be handled at the staff level, we don't want the applicant being burdened of going back to the planning commission in case those type of uh, changes may be necessary. 
Mr. Town. Thank you, uh, Chair Fisher. Just to augment those comments, the intent of that condition is, as Mr. Chua mentioned, really to uh, enable staff to address minor technical changes due to principally, as was mentioned, surveying changes. Um, if, for instance, the pad elevation is a few inches off or the lot size is a few square feet off, then we would process that administratively uh, through the, the project. But anything of significance, anything that alters the intent of these conditions would need to come back to the Planning Commission. Uh, Commissioner Ferris. And I guess just to confirm with that, we used a hypothetical there about whether they'd go to 12 lots and that would squish it down. However, the zoning for this is maximum four and a half. They're at 4.46. So unless the house is really, really tiny, they, they wouldn't be squeezing any more onto this. And so they would all be around 65 feet uh, frontage on the street. That would be correct. The um the um, the example I gave is a hypothetical situation that does not necessarily apply to this one. However, you, you made a good point that they cannot go any further than 10 lots because of the density limit. I just want to make sure anybody's hearing this on TV or anything like that. You know, the, the hy that hypothetical is really just to, for us to understand the conditions, not necessarily that could actually happen on this property, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Price. Just um, one other question to staff and a point of clarification. There was um, uh, the, part of the staff's recommendation is that that corner lot uh, be a single story uh, home. And, uh, but it also talks about the fact that at least 40% of the units are single story. If they, were to, if they were to ask to change that, that would be a major modification, I assume, and would have to come back. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Town. Uh, that is correct. Uh, a minimum 40%, so four of the 10 need to be single story, including uh, each end, lots one and 10. So that, a change to that, for instance, would be a significant item and, and would come back to the Planning Commission. Commissioner Terpel. Yes, I was wondering if our uh, city attorney could, uh, uh, I was reading the part and I made a, mar uh, a note about it, uh, that this is a, a vesting tentative map. And I'm wondering if you might be able to explain, um, especially for the sake of the viewers, what that is. Yes. In normal development, um, a, a city is able to change its development policies, including zoning, up to the time that a building permit is issued and expense by the developer has occurred. The vesting tentative map is to give developers certainty about what development standards will be in place at the time that the application for the map is deemed complete. All zoning, um, development standards, policies, fees that were in effect at that time remain in effect for the duration of the, the vesting map. And the purpose behind that again is to give the developer certainty in terms of what will be allowed um, for planning purposes, for entitlement um, purposes. Any other questions? No. Anything else from staff? Um, we don't have any more uh, to add. Okay, we'll go back to the applicant, Mr. Kirschenstein. Uh, you have five minute rebuttal. Uh, nothing to add. Thank you, sir. So we will close the public hearing and open to uh, commission comments. Commissioner Reynolds. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to uh, move approval of VT. TM 2011-70018 and the RPD 2011-70019 with the findings and conditions as in the packet and with the change of the numbering system of the conditions one, well, I guess it should read three through, uh, four through the end of the conditions. And I'm really glad to see this. I hope that this time you really can find a buyer and the property can be sold and the school district, I think, will gain both ways on this, that uh, right now that really isn't a school behind the property. And I don't know what the noise, but I would hope that the homeowners moving in would realize uh, the property behind them and would know that what they were going to be living with. Comments to the motion? 
No. Vote, please. Motion passed 5 0. And there's a 10 day appeal period. Uh, we will move to uh, our next item, uh, Community Development Department. Mr. Town. Thank you, uh, Chair Fisher. This item 7A in your packet has to do with the city's uh, capital improvement project program for 2011 to 2013. Uh, by or under state law, I should say, the Planning Commission is required to review the city CIP, which comes before you every two years, to determine its consistency with the general plan. Uh, this item went to the City Council on April 12th, and at that time the Council referred it uh, to the Planning Commission for review and uh, finding of consistency on the general plan. The uh, CIP uh, manual that you are provided under separate cover describes all of the projects. Uh, there are 155 projects anticipated over the next five years, 91 of which will occur within the next two years. Uh, that uh, CIP manual categorizes the different projects, most of which are public works uh, related to streets, undergrounding, water, wastewater, uh, topics such as that. And in terms of general plan consistency, we're really, really looking at this in terms of three different uh, areas. One are the general plan goals, which are included on page 67 of your packet. And a uh, particular project may be, in fact, all of them really are to some degree consistent with those overarching nine general pl uh, plan goals. Then there are also policies that we also included in your packet tonight that also begins on page 67, and those uh, follow nine different categories, uh, coincidentally, and provide further policy guidance in terms of the general plan. And then to augment uh, that, that, if that wasn't enough, we have uh, general plan elements. We have seven of which are uh, mandated by the state. And then we have an additional five elements, uh, which are optional elements that have been adopted by the city over the years. Uh, so in your CIP uh, budget, manual, program manual. There is a description of each one of these projects and a description in it, a very brief description of general plan consistency. Uh, what we'll be doing tonight is uh, soliciting comments from the commission on those projects. And in that vein, I did want to mention in the supplemental packet, we did include uh, general plan consistency uh, relationships, so to speak, for 11 projects which in the CIP uh, manual uh, were not correctly categorized according to elements of the general plan or did not cite an element of the general plan. In fact, all the projects in the capital improvement uh, program are consistent with some element of the general plan or general plan goals and policies. And so those are contained on page two of your supplemental packet, which includes the project numbers, titles, and the consistency findings. To uh, conclude then, staff is recommending tonight that the uh, commission uh, review the CIP program and to find it consistent with the Thousand Oaks General Plan, subject to those revisions that I just mentioned uh, contained in your supplemental packet. And then in addition, that that finding be conveyed to the City Council, which is scheduled to consider this item on June 14th. Uh, this evening, in addition to myself, we have several other staff members. Uh, who are uh, here to answer questions and illuminate any of these uh, projects that you may have uh, questions about. And, and those include, uh, seated up from left to right, Dean Morales, Engineering Division Manager with Public Works, uh, Brent Sakaida, our Budget Officer in the Finance Department, and Liz Perez, our Facilities Manager for the City. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions, uh, staff? Commissioner Ferris. Thank you. Um, I just I I did have a um, couple questions on some of the uh, the projects um, just to get it just to get background. Um, page forty three. This is in the transportation traffic project. This is the Auto Mall Street parking modifications. Is this one point five five two? Is that the same two million that was previously set aside by the council as part of the uh, approvals that happened over the last six months? Or is this a different? 
Uh, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Brent Scott. I'm the Budget Officer for the City of Thousand Oaks. And uh, yes, it is part of the $2 million that was set aside. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, then one other one was it was noted on page 148 uh, the facility project the 401403 Hillcrest exterior painting uh, that the the um, those properties on West Hillcrest are designated as, as a historic landmark and um, back then on page 142 which talks about the Kelly Road land purchase um, my understanding is, is that there is also on the property a uh, historic landmark of the Canal Valley High School. I just wanted to make sure that that was noted as well, if possible. They're both equivalent with respect to their notes. So. And they're both, they're both city landmarks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, other than that, uh, I did want to thank Mr. Town and, and staff for, for clarifying some of my questions earlier today. Thank you. Commissioner Reynolds. Thank you. And I'm just always happy to see that we're still putting in for the curb cuts and, and uh, going, you, going towards the SB 821 funds. I sat on that committee for 11 years with the county. And uh, people would always say, how can Thousand Oaks spend so much money on the curb cuts? And the only answer was is that we do them right. And I'm glad to see that apparently the uh, Transportation Commission, they're still doling out, it used to be a process of the, the committee uh, reviewing the projects and seeing which one, when they had so much money to spend, how much they could give the cities, and the cities would do the matching. And I noticed on page 17 that they're still doing that. And uh, I was pleased to see that the city's continued with that. And I think the Disabled Access Board reviews those curb cuts first before it's actually applied to the county. So. Any other questions of staff? Commissioner Capel? Uh, not so much a question, but a statement. It just, uh, as I went through this, because uh, we got this uh, report on, on Wednesday evening, it just absolutely amazes me how much this city does behind the scenes that most people just don't know. So I want to commend staff, and uh, thank you very much. Commissioner Reynolds. But the sidewalk on Canal School Road wasn't it. I immediately went and looked to see if it was one that was listed, but I noticed we had a, a public uh, comment tonight regarding the sidewalk on Canal School. So maybe in the future. Uh, one question from me on uh, starting on page 27 with the undergrounding and the projects that are mentioned. Uh, just confirming that these are actually going to happen. They aren't tied into uh, any proposed project, the current projects that have already been agreed to. Yes, Ms. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I'm Dean Morales uh, with Public Works Department. And yes, uh, we, we are proceeding with those projects without any uh, restrictions on how we're implementing those. Great, thank you. No other questions? Okay, we'll go to uh, public comment. We aren't done yet. <laughs> uh, go to public comment. Uh, Mr. Kidway, uh, you're back up with five minutes. Nick Kidwai, resident of Newberry Park, Director of Concerned Citizens of Thousand Oaks, Honorable Chair Fisher, Planning Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on your CIP program. Even though I still remain disappointed, like so many other people, that uh, there is still no economic element uh, to the uh, planning, uh, general plan. Uh, it's been 20 years since some of us have been asking for it, including uh, Mayor Fury's uh, Planning Commission appointment. I, my mic is going, so I don't remember his name, uh, but uh, uh, he was the one that had asked, and staff, I mean, despite all the praise for the staff, the staff was supposed to do research and come back on it. It's been 20 years, and we're still waiting. And that's one of the frustrating things about uh, participating in this process is that uh, uh, 
we are told time and again that uh, 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 the planning commissioners are not allowed to look at the economic effects as if uh, we were in some kind of a uh, different kind of a system. Uh, I realize you are just talking about the CIP budget and not uh, the whole picture, but uh, uh, I have always said that the issue in this city is not a lack of funds or cutback in funds, but having too many dollars, too many dollars. And so even in this economy, you're looking at $71 million, uh, and the whole budget is $191 million or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I do appreciate your having the packet here, uh, but uh, I think there was a binder or something with the projects. Uh, I uh, didn't see anything on the web. I went to the Nibari Park Library. I didn't see anything there. There ain't anything over here. So I do appreciate that you have something on the in the supplemental packet, which I appreciate. Uh, TOTV, I would like to show the overhead of from the 1970 original general plan. This is unbelievable. Ultimate capacity, I don't know, some ladies are able to do it. Uh, you can see the 180,000 that was projected. I mean, so, I mean, uh, slow growth people, I mean, that's one of the reasons I take umbrage with them is that, uh, I mean, we've cut back from 180 to 130,000. I guess valuable time is slipping, but uh, it's nothing like uh, overheads. This is, I would like to just show it because I'm not making it up. Page 42 of the original general plan. Uh, if you can show it to your TV, I know it's hard to read. Uh, at the bottom, public buildings, and uh, that's you have something like that uh, uh, in your supplemental. A small 1,500 auditorium is recommended for construction within the next five years. Its cost is estimated at $525,000, not $100 million. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, I mean, it makes you cry, but sometimes laughing is a better antidote. I guess I don't need that. Your staff on Mondays is really useful, uh, helpful. Uh, one minute left. Just one issue that, I mean, since I don't have access to the projects, uh, you had approved, uh, or the city had approved three years ago, painting this parking structure at the blob. I mean, it's so ugly, and this building has been built without enough funds. And it was approved for $300,000. And then, lo and behold, there was a provision or something that it was canceled due to lack of funds. And it's a premier painting company. I talked to gent the gentleman. He lives in Thousand Oaks, uh, but the uh, warehouse is in Canoga Park, and uh, nothing is on the horizon or the agenda. Uh, so the priorities, I mean, they ain't with the citizens. I mean, it's, I mean, like I said, $525,000 for an auditorium, and now just the subsidy for the auditorium uh, runs higher than that. I mean. Should I cry? One thing that I will hopefully speak and or maybe somebody else can do some research which has escaped the Planning Commission uh, process is the change in the automotive, is that the service stations or gas stations have all become retail outlets now. And how many are there? How much they are selling? This is cannibalizing from existing businesses. Thank you for letting me speak. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mr. Kidway. Uh, go back to staff. Uh, any additional things you need to cover? Any questions of staff? Okay. Um, go to uh, commission comment. Commissioner Ferris. Well, at, at this point, I'd go ahead and make a motion for recommendation. Uh, I move that we find the proposed uh, capital improvement program for fiscal years 2011-2012 and 2012-2013 to be consistent with the Thousand Oaks General Plan and that this finding be conveyed to the City Council. Comments to the motion? With the changes provided by staff. With the changes provided by staff. Comments to the motion? Okay, vote please. 
Motion passed, 5-0. Okay, uh, Community Development Department reports and referrals, Mr. Town. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Just to bring the, uh, to, to the Commission's attention, your upcoming schedule, which is on page 72 of your packet. We have one case scheduled for uh, your next meeting in two weeks, having to do with an amendment to specific plan 15 for the Rancho Conejo Industrial Park. Uh, at this time, no hearings scheduled for June 13th. And then, although there, it's not shown entirely here, but on June 27th, we have both the case that's mentioned, which is an appeal of an administrative decision, as well as at least one other case and possibly two more. So we will be meeting on May 23rd and June 27th, but most likely not on June 13th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Town. Uh, minutes of April 11th, 2011. Commissioner Reynolds. Move approval of the minutes of the meeting of the Planning Commission, April 11, 2011. Comments to the motion? Vote, please. Motion passed, 5-0. Uh, AB 1234 reports. Anything to report? Okay. Uh, on to commission comments. Any commission comments? Commissioner Price. Yeah, I don't know if now would be the appropriate time or not, but I'm, I'm going to dip my toe in the water and find out. Um, I, I will uh, be out of town on May 23rd, so I will not be at the meeting. Just wanted to let you all know. Other comments? Commissioner Reynolds. And if it's appropriate, I'd like to congratulate Commissioner uh, Price's sons uh, graduating from the Sheriff's Academy in Ventura County. Thank you very much. Other comments? Um, I'd like to adjourn this meeting in memory of my little brother, Scott, who passed away 12 years ago, and today is his birthday. So uh, happy birthday, Scott. Uh, we will adjourn to 6.30 p.m. on May 23rd, 2011.